Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. If you could pair convert and capital structure our strategies, which also have the benefit, in addition to what I said of being long gamma, not reliant on the greater fool, but they're also you're also getting paid to wait because you know part of what's different about convertible arb versus options arb is that you're actually positive carry, right? In many cases, in most cases, at least back then. Um, so if you pair that with certain uh, selected merger arb positions um, on a systemic basis, you're kind of protected against these idiosyncratic you know, blow ups every once in a while, but you might be able to extract a, a pretty interesting alpha stream. Saddle up everybody because we've got the urban cowboy on today. He's ridden everything from ponies to draft horses to Mustangs over his 30 plus years in the investment game. Doing commodities and derivatives at Goldman in the 90s, risk arb at Canyon Partners, and then opportunistic value at his own fund, Acanthos Capital Management, before hanging up his spurs and focusing on running his own family office. Uh, we're talking with Michael Cow and diving into his extensive investing experience, Star Wars fandom, and what he's up to these days. So welcome, Michael. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Good to meet you. Uh, so we were just talking briefly. You're out in LA. I spent most of my life in Southern California with a short stint on the East Coast. That period of time I was working for Goldman Sachs and then uh, business school in Philly. So that was my five years. And then I've been in LA ever since. Tell me the LA investment scene. There are a lot of firms out there are they moving out of there because yeah I, so i would characterize la as uh a very uh credit driven investment scene because of the uh the roots of drexel out here mm -hmm. um so after after drexel basically disbanded there was like a big diaspora out of drexel and so um you know the shop that i went to after after business school was canyon uh, founded by uh, two uh, ex Drexel guys, Josh Friedman and Mitch Jules. But then uh, also in the area, you know, obviously know about Oak Tree, Howard Marks, mm -hmm. and Aries and Apollo. I mean, so all, all these guys basically came out of Drexel. So there, there tends to be a, an agglomeration of um, funds with, uh, with credit slash distressed backgrounds. Hmm. And so Canyon. Out there too, right? What's that? Gunlocks out there too. Yeah, yeah. A lot of credit. So we're sorry, we I cut you off. What were you going to say about distress? Yeah, no. Yeah, so what I was going to say was that, like, you know, when I when I ended, so my my career before Canyon was in a completely different area. I was at in the J. Aaron Group of Goldman Sachs trading commodities. I was one of two traders making markets in the then nascent Goldman Sachs Commodity Index and um and uh, making markets on the underlying futures contract you know, total return swaps and structured notes tied to that derivative it was the first investable real investable commodity index um so uh when i was graduating from business school and looking for job opportunities you know most of the most of the opportunities that i had were in convertible and capital structure and risk art. So, you know, I had a, had a job offer back then from Citadel when they were uh, starting off another firm called HBK. But I really wanted to be back in LA. And yeah. so 
So when I got the job with uh, Canyon, ironically, um, I didn't really know where I was going to fit in. And I, and quite frankly, I think that my bosses then didn't really know where I was going to fit in because my background was more of a derivatives background. I really had no credit expertise. And, you know, they uh, were very, very long on credit expertise and back then weren't as familiar um, with derivatives. So what I wound up doing at Canyon was kind of carving out my own niche and focusing on the convertible capital structure area because, you know, that's that part of the capital structure is very interesting. If you think about what a convertible bond is, you know, it's it's a bond partially. It has an embedded option in it to convert into equity. So you need to you need to study credit worthiness. You need to study equity valuation. You need to study option valuation. So um, it was a great uh, great place to learn a lot about the entire capital structure. Uh, let me backtrack for a second. So back at Goldman. So one, did you know Mike Dolly, the uh, head of the futures business there? He was on the board with me at NFA. He was a great guy. So anyway, no, no, um, I was I was at I was at Goldman from ninety two to ninety five. Okay. So so you know relatively brief stint. And actually, my my very first job at at Goldman was in the IT group. I my my undergraduate background was in electrical engineering, computer science. So I joined the IT group and wound up uh, designing the currency option software, which was how I wound up uh, on the uh, trading desk. That, that's a whole, that's a different, interesting, serendipitous story about how that happened. Yeah. And we, this has been a common theme, like the last five of the last 10 podcasts we've done are all engineering, you know, majors. Oh, really? Here. Yeah. So there's yeah. Yeah. a common thread. They just see investments and trading in a unique way. Right. Well, I, I want. I wanted to be. A, I wanted to be a video game designer growing up. So, <laughs> but I. But I guess uh, you know, running a hedge fund. That's kind of like playing a video game, I suppose. <laughs> exactly. With live bullets. <sighs> right. The, um, so, second thing with the Goldman Commodity Index, like a lot of people I've known in my career, basically built a business and a career front running that eventually. Um, yeah. Right. I Legally, know all about that. Yeah. So was that part of how soon after that did you guys know that was going on and were you doing things to try? Oh, to yeah. It? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, well. So so if you're familiar with the index, right, at the time, there were 22 underlying commodities. I think they've expanded it since. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't an issue in the beginning because, you know, it was a very illiquid contract and there was enough underlying liquidity in each of the underlying commodities to really not be a big deal but you know circa i want to say like 1993 which was when i uh became one of the traders for the index we had um the pension fund of a major u.s corporation come in and make uh just a very small allocation to commodities and they wanted to come in via uh the futures contract so i as one of the market makers had to basically stand up and basically offer any amount of liquidity, um, right, to to this big pension. And so I then had to go ARB, you know, the the underlying 22 different commodities. And as you can imagine, you're, there are certain commodities, especially the meats and the softs that are notoriously illiquid. Yep. And um, every index role, it became a huge game where we had to figure out, okay, how do we, the locals know exactly what days of the month we're supposed to roll and they're going to be set up to front run us. And we needed to figure out, okay, how do we outwit the locals? <laughs> it was fun. It was yeah. pretty fun. Which they're as street smart as it gets. So tough to outwit those guys. Um, yeah. Well, especially at institutional size, right? We're the paper market. And so we had to come index. in. Index, you couldn't go too far yeah. out of the defined parameters. Right? That that's exactly right. Yep. Um, and what kind of size are we talking? Like you're slinging thousand lots in the meats, or it was oh gosh, I if if memory serves, this is a while ago now. I mean, you know, I I was making like ten thousand lot up markets. Yeah. Um, you know, and in an index, which at that point, you know, the locals market was maybe like ten up. 
right? right? Yeah. So I had, I had to be at like, you know, 10,000 up, you know, what do you want to do? <laughs> right. And they're like, woo, we got yeah. one. We got one on the line. Goldman. Right, company. right. I right, can't remember right, the right. sign for Goldman. I, so I was in the bond pits uh, when I started. Um, so there okay. was Carr and Deutsche and um, okay, yeah. You know, everyone had a symbol, but I can't remember what Goldman's was. But oh, we our our uh, our trader. His uh, his name he went by Ski. <laughs> Ski, right? Yeah, but yeah. that was the whole game. Yeah, and they're like, okay, Goldman's coming, and you just everyone puts their hand in their pockets, right, and just wait. Yeah. Till- Offer more well, advice. I had to, you know, as part of, you know, one of the things that they make you do as, you know, when you're one of the low guys on the totem pole coming up the ranks of Jay Aaron is they make you clerk uh, in one of the pits for like, you know, a month or a couple months. Oh, fun. So I, uh, so I clerked um, in the Comex gold pit for a little bit and got my, you know, share of, you know, just, you know, being, being in the pits and, you know, just trying to, you know, acquire some you know sweet sm- street smarts from just watching the open outcry action i mean it's it was pretty cool cool experience i tell people like the amount of paper is what you can't <clears throat> imagine like you can imagine these big dudes screaming and yelling but just the amount of paper at the end of the day lining the floor oh, it's was, incredible yeah it was like incredible. such needed disruption more than anything. and physically and physically exhausting yeah just being in there that's why the hours so. were so short <laughs> right right um so sorry a little trip down a uh, trading pit memory lane which is always fun right. so then from there you said enough with this i'm gonna go to business school well it wasn't it wasn't so much enough with it but like um i you know because i studied uh electrical engineering and computer science there weren't a lot of degrees of freedom in that major i mean you're studying pretty specialized stuff and so obviously i had i had picked up a lot of a lot of knowledge about trading and options and whatnot from being on the job, but I never felt like I had a formal uh, finance education. So decided to go back to business school and kind of broaden my uh, horizons a little bit. So that's why. Yeah. And then at Canyon, so you started to dive into that. You're, it was mostly convertible bond arbs. Yeah. So when I, when I, when I joined Canyon, uh, Canyon was primarily, um, in, you know, high yield, uh, bank debt, you know, and also they had a direct lending business and, you know, super, super smart, uh, group, um, heavy, heavy on the fundamental analysis, which if you think about it was kind of alien to me because my, in my world of commodities, right. You do macroeconomic analysis, but most of the trading analysis is technical, right? Mm -hmm. So I had a totally different skill set. But um, I think the, I gravitated towards the one part of the capital structure that I felt was A, orphaned um, at that time. This was circa 1997. Um, So relatively inefficient uh, convertible market. Um, And also, Within Canyon, the organization, it wasn't a well-covered asset class because convertibles tend to be senior unsecured notes. And, you know, most of the high yield um, um, analysts, you know, focused on stuff that was senior. So so I looked at the the junkier uh, credits. But it was there. Junkier, alpha, sorry, were there alpha was like we we can tell better than the next guy the better credit worthiness. Right. We're getting overpaid for the actual risk we're taking. Yeah. 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 That's right. So you said, I, right, I can do that at even a riskier tranche. Well, I, 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 so, so I, I wrote a white paper um, um, probably around 1998. Uh, it was entitled Alpha with Asymmetry. So I, I came up with this idea that I thought, well, you know, there are certain asset classes or certain strategies that are inherently um, long gamma, right? So I think of convertible arbitrage, capital structure arbitrage as inherently long gamma type types of uh, asset classes. And and um, um, the other the other interesting thing, the the other interesting dynamic of about these strategies is that they're not reliant upon a greater fool, right, for an exit strategy. So mm-hmm. as long as you're able to buy implied vol cheaper than actuals, and 
essentially dynamically hedge, right? You're able to extract the value without necessarily relying on the greater fool. So that was very, very attractive to me. But then I also thought, well, you know, there, there are certain type, you know, back in 1997, 1998, um, there were some risk arb spreads were very, very wide. This is, you know, we're heading into the, uh, the big telecom internet bubble times, right? And don't forget, 1998 was the period of uh, LTCM when, and when LTCM blew up, you know, they had levered risk arb positions. And so, you know, there, so I was also very attracted to playing some of these really, really juicy risk arb deals. But I recognize that, you know, risk arb uh, tends to be a short gamma type of strategy, right? So like, if you're, if you Can think you give about an example? The, Yeah, so like, so, I, so if you, if you, if you think about the typical uh, friendly risk arb deal, as something that has a 95% chance of uh, consummating, in, in which case you make a buck on the spread, but you've got a 5%, 5 chance of a deal bust, in which case you might lose 10 bucks, right? Yeah. That, that type of risk reward is very similar to being short ball, right? At least short tails, right? So, so, and but, so I, but, I used to call that merger, or, but you're calling it risk. Merger. Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah, merger arm, merger arm. Um, so, <clears throat> but um, the the point of my paper though was that this alpha with asymmetry thesis was that you know if you could pair convert and capital structure arm strategies, which also have the benefit in addition to what I said of being long gamma, not reliant on the greater fool, but they're also you're also getting paid to wait because you know part of what's different about convertible arm versus options arm is that you're actually positive carry, right? In many cases, in most cases, at least back then. Um, so if you pair that with certain uh, selected merger ARB positions, um, on a systemic basis, you're kind of protected against these idiosyncratic, you know, blow ups every once in a while, but you might be able to extract a, a pretty interesting alpha stream. So anyways, so, the point, the point of that paper was to basically pitch the partners there uh, to let me um, run a portfolio like this. And, um, you know, they, they let me have the ball and run with it. And I wound up uh, kind of carving out a little niche business within Canyon. You know, we, we started a, a fund, uh, I think, back in 2000 or 2001 called the Canyon Capital Arbitrage Fund, which was a a separate fund to showcase that strategy. And then, um, you know, when I eventually left in 2002, um, I always wanted to strike out on my own and, you know, do my own thing. I pursued a, a strategy mix that was pretty similar, um, yeah. at least initially, and then it evolved over time. And so did your, so A, is that paper still out there? Can we put it in the show notes? In, on the uh, that 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 I can't. That is that is a proprietary. Okay, paper, sorry. I but, thought you meant but, you put it out into the world as a white paper. No, no, no. I, it, was, it was an internal white paper that I presented as a. Yes. yes. Got it, got it. And then two, did your thesis prove true? Like through the whole dot com bust and all that. You know, yeah. I mean, at that, you know, during, you know, it's. I, I've learned. Um, throughout the years, though, that um, you know, a lot of a lot of investment success also happens to be being in the right asset class at the right time. So, I'm not going to give myself too much credit uh, and and say that oh yeah, this was all because like you know I had this brilliant thesis. I'm going to say that like you know that at that period in time, um, the convertible asset class was a great place to be. It was a relatively orphaned asset class. There weren't that many um, sophisticated players in it. Um, and at the same time, um, you had this, this lead up into the internet bubble where you had unbelievable actual realized vol in a lot across the board. Uh, and yet, if you were, if you knew credit analysis and could be in the right credits where the bond floors actually held up in the in the face of a stock collapse, um, you could make a lot of money. And so, you know, uh, you know, my my business at the time, 
um, was uh, was uh, really resilient during during the dot com bust. Yeah, congrats yeah. for that. And it was, so then it was you, a fun place to be, right? Because you'd think like that was the mother of all credit risk, right? A lot of firms blew up and didn't have the uh, cash to pay out. Yeah, I mean, well, so so I, you know, it's interesting because now I've now lived through a lot of different uh, uh, credit regimes, and so, so, you know, 1998 was a was a different story. But I, I, again, I'm going to say I got lucky there because I was just starting my business and I didn't have a lot of capital committed, um, and I didn't have uh, leverage, right? So I was in a good spot to capitalize on some of the um some of the uh, uh blow-ups that were caused in the wake of ltcm but um in 2008 however you know i took it on the chin um even though i supposedly had a long ball strategy right yeah. the, the problem the problem in 2008 is that you know you had yeah you had a big ball event but it was more the credit ball was probably even higher than equity ball right so so if you think about what a convertible chart looks like, um, you know, it, uh, you know, if I were to kind of sketch it out, right, it kind of, if you think of a bond as, you know, you know, going back to the sort of Merton real options framework, right, a bond is, can be modeled kind of like a short put on assets, right, on the assets of a firm. The equity of a company is kind of like a long call option on the assets of a firm. So a convertible bond, what it looks like, uh, if you were to graph it out, um, it kind of looks like a, you're, you're short a put, um, um, and the part where it acts like a put is when the company goes into financial distress, and then it starts uh, acting more like a, like a call option as the equity and the firm succeeds, right? So, so with 2008 happening the the bond floor that convert arbs bank on to uh hold uh in order to start covering their equity deltas in a stock crash well those bond floors were just they weren't there (laughs) in in many cases the bonds fell faster than the equity which never didn't make any sense but it was because you had a you had a credit event that that and that caused the illiquid bonds to gap much more severely than even the equities at that time. So you're so you're delta hedging it. You're short the equity, but the what you're saying is the bonds were whatever two three x down more than the equities. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah. You're in, delta, many, in many cases. And then in theory, you could dynamically adjust that ratio, but. It's kind of yeah. It's it, it's tricky. No so so yeah. So like what what I was talking about earlier about how you know so like over time you know my strategy uh, evolved uh, because you know if you stuck with a traditional convert arm uh, playbook, you typically are long the convertible bond and you're short stock and you dynamically hedge the convertible bond like you would an option, right? But um, there was so much dislocation in and around the financial crisis and afterwards that, you know, we became much more creative in terms of how to play different parts of the capital structure. So in some cases, you know, to even out the implicit put that I'm short, but, you know, in, in my long convert position, I might be short another piece of debt in the capital structure. Um, you know, um, I might be taking on senior subord- subordinate basis risk by doing that. Um, in some cases, uh, we would uh, create really interesting synthetic payoffs. So, so um, you know, it, for instance, like, you know, in a GM capital structure, I, I was involved in the General Motors capital structure over a 10-year period, but we played it at every uh, length along that curve, uh, initially as a uh, pure convertible ARB position, uh, and then at a later point when the stock had cratered and you know a lot of the bonds were much more credit sensitive, 
uh, there came a point in time where you could buy the convertible bonds. I can't remember the exact yield, so I'm just going to use round numbers. Let's mm -hmm. say that you could buy the convertible bonds at like a 10% yield, right? Um, there, there was a situation where you could actually short um, similar duration straight bonds for like a 9% yield. Now think about how crazy that relationship is, right? A convertible should never yield more than the equivalent duration straight bond because presumably you're willing to, to pay up for that embedded optionality. Right. But here was a situation where the convertible market was so inefficient and distressed that you could buy a convert that, that was yielding, say, 100 basis points more than the straight bond. Just because nobody sure. wanted the stock. Right. So, so, you, so what we did was in that situation, we basically just shorted the straight bond. And basically, you, just, you, you, you have a slightly positive carry position and you have an embedded call option left over. Right? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And although GE kept kept wandering yeah yeah and yeah well so so eventually General Motors so so here's another example so like eventually you know during the financial crisis the Obama administration was basically making up a lot of the rules as it went along right and so yeah. there came a point in time when they um, were uh, making deals in Chrysler's capital structure with the unions uh, and but but making the senior secured lenders take a haircut so when that happened senior unsecured convertibles and gm cratered down to something like five or six cents on the dollar in which case we shifted our strategy again now we're we're thinking okay you know what now forget about hedging i mean these these deeply distressed convertible bonds at five or six cents on the dollar represent very very interesting fulcrum securities right so in the case where at the end of the day if you know we are a, a land of laws uh eventually if if you know in a, in a more regular sort of restructuring process these these security like our our uh bonds were treated as peri pursue with some of the um the uh the pension obligations yeah. Um, then the the recovery ought to be fifty cents, not five cents. So it became an outright distress bet. So we became very uh, just fluid in the way we look at the capital structure. We'd play in equity, we'd play in bonds, we'd play in bank debt in some cases, um, and we'd be long and short any parts of the capital structure. Um, and that was once at a and how do I say it? Acanthos. Echinos? Yeah, yeah, Acanthos, yeah. One of those, Acanthos? So that was yeah. once you moved over to Acanthos, or was it still at Canyon? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I started Acanthos back in 2002. So, oh, you know, yeah. financial crisis, you know, we, we had already been uh, in the thick of things for quite a while when the financial crisis yeah. happened. And yeah. my takeaway is, like, don't try this at home, right? Like, <laughs> professional... Well, so this is why you need a hedge fund manager, right? This is complex. Yeah, we, I mean, our, our, our strategy was definitely more, uh, more complex, but, you know, back then, you know, I, I would say that, you know, if you, if you spoke to our investors back then and asked them what sort of was our differentiator is that we were very creative in how to structure, structure trades, right? So, you know, we did a, um, if you want another trade example, I can give you an interesting one. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll label this. I'll label this example like the the most interesting trade that never made any money. <laughs> um, so there, so whole, there in of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it was great in concept. Um, so there was there was a there was a company called El Paso, which was you know pipeline company, and yeah. back then they were very they were very very levered, and um, uh, they had a, a short dated convertible bond that was yielding you know again I, don't, I forget the exact yields, but let's say it was yielding ten percent. To like a one-year put, right? So most people would just buy that piece of paper at ninety, and then with the anticipation that in a year it's gonna you're gonna get par back, right? Mm -hmm. But but and if you think about that, that's kind of like playing a merger arc, right? Because it's a very dis, it's a very levered credit, and so chances are you're gonna get par, you're gonna make your ten points, right? But in that small likelihood where the company defaults, you could wind up getting hurt right yeah uh, especially when we noticed that there was a very long dated 
uh, bond that was Perry Pissou trading in the 70s. And th this is like a, maybe like a 20, 20 year duration bond trading in the 70s, right? So, and then um, the, the bank debt at the time was yielding, you know, we could, we could, I think it was like a piece of a revolver that we were looking at that was yielding something like 8%. And that bank that was super, super senior secured solid, right? No, no credit worries. So we created this really interesting trade. I'll, I'll call it like a synthetic uh, event option. What we did was we, we went along the bank debt just because you know it was like an eight per, very super safe eight percent piece of carry, but then we shorted the convert at ninety, um, and we went long the long bond at call it seventy cents on the dollar, and so the so if you think about it right, if the company winds up in bankruptcy, in bankruptcy. I used to uh, tell this to my analysts and in bankruptcy, it, it doesn't matter what a bond's maturity is because bankruptcy is the event that snaps all the maturities to zero. Yeah. Right. So, so in a bankruptcy, the 90 cent bond that we're short will converge to the 70 cent bond that we're long. So you're protected. You're, you know, that, that 20 point basis will collapse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and, and our 8%, senior secured piece of paper is going to be untouched. So we're, we're golden in a bankruptcy, right? But there were rumors that Chevron Texaco uh, was circling, uh, looking to potentially buy this company. And if they bought this company, because this company is already very levered, it would most likely be a stock for stock transaction. So in a stock for stock transaction, the, the, the acquiring company just assumes the underlying bonds of El Paso, right? Well, this is where it got it got it gets really interesting because if we had a change of control, our converts that we were short were puttable at par on a change of control. So our losses on our short uh, would be capped out at ten points. Yeah. But our long bond at seventy would all of a sudden become Chevron Texaco credit, and when we modeled what that would mean, you could make sixty points yeah, on yeah, that yeah. long bond, right? And meanwhile our bank debt again would still be slow and steady 8%, right? So it was a really, really interesting trade, super asymmetric in both, in, on both sides. But, you know, we, we held it for a while. I mean, when you, when you put these trades on, uh, you, part of the reason why this type of trade worked pre-financial crisis and didn't post-financial crisis is, you know, it required good marginability from prime brokers, right? And pre-global financial crisis, we had great marginability on doing stuff like this. Not so much post-financial crisis. Because if, so, you, if you just have to put up the funds capital, it's, it's not exciting. It doesn't get people out of bed. It's like two, 3% or something. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. So like this type of trade, you know, um, you know, only makes sense if you have great margin terms because, you know, and, and pre-financial crisis was, you know, you could, you know, these prime brokers um, understood that, you know, you had a trade that basically had, had there was almost no way you could lose money on the trade. Yeah. So they gave you very generous margin terms, right? But post-financial crisis, they didn't care um, whether you had a bulletproof, you know, trade like this. They just weren't going to give you the terms. Right. They're like, we don't yeah. care. It's a trade. It's risk on our books. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Classic. Um, yeah. And what, if you were still doing this today, what do you think this current environment is like? Like impossible for this kind of thing? Oh, it's like much harder, much, yeah. much harder. I mean, well, so, so you know, uh, it's weird because the, the, the capital markets are pretty messed up. I have a feeling that like for these type of trades, we still wouldn't be getting great marginability. But then you hear about people like Bill Huang getting like, you know, 10x on being long, you know, meme stocks. So like, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I, it boggles the mind. Um, the other thing I'll say well, is the, that, you know. The rumor mill on that I, one was that uh, when the repo rate went negative or something, they were basically paying him to take on more leverage. Was I, it's, it's, it's really, this, this is what a very long period of zero interest rate policy will do, right? It just winds up distorting financial markets across the board. 
But um, what I was going to say about the convertible market specifically is that, you know, this is not the convertible market that I cut my teeth on right now. I mean, if we want to segue a little bit to what you originally contacted me about, which is micro strategy, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you look at these, you look at these converts that he issued, right? The first one was like a, you know, 75 basis point coupon. And then uh, the second one that he issued was basically a zero, right? And, you know, you had, you, you know, in, in the early 2000s, you definitely had a bunch of these really, you know, similarly crappy looking converts, I'll say, you know, very low coupon, et cetera. Um, um, so it's not entirely uh, different, but this, this micro strategy situation is very, very interesting. I'm not at all involved in Bitcoin or MicroStrategy, but I, I view it as a, uh, a case study in the making, <laughs> let's just say. So let's dive into that a little. So outside of MicroStrategy, and you mentioned it quickly, like that, that nice thread you did was laying out how the capital structure is like an option. So you touched on that briefly, maybe expand on that a little bit more. And then, yeah, the part B is how is their board allowing what they're, what they're doing and what's the end game and all that going to look like. Yeah. So, so just to back up a step, right. So I, I talked about earlier how, you know, like in the Merton framework of real options, the accounting identity itself gives you uh, an option way of looking at a capital structure, right? So a, a long bond position is akin to being short a put on the assets of a firm with the strike price being the par amount of bonds outstanding. And then uh, on the flip side of that, the underlying equity of, of a firm is basically a call option on the firm's assets with the strike price of that call option, again, being the strike price of the par amount of debt outstanding. So if you think about it, right, that's the accounting identity. Your equity isn't going to be worth anything until that that um, that par amount of debt is satisfied. Um, uh, conversely, if the assets of the firm are less than the par, are worth less than the par amount of debt, um, then your bonds are going to be impaired. That's why they look like a short put position, right? So the point I wrote and three threads in my strategy. That's just pure capital structure. We're not that's just in, that. that's 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 just capital structure in general. But the first thread on micro strategy that I wrote uh, was back in April, and I called it you know, it's it, like micro strategy, a real options analysis. And I basically laid out this framework where I said, look, I mean, <clears throat> he, he, so this guy, Michael Saylor, you know, prior to any of these Bitcoin um, transactions, micro strategy um, was a, was a pretty, you know, sort of slow, you know, low growth, steady, steady eddy SaaS business worth about a you know, billion dollars or so. Right. Um, but he then issues two tranches of convertibles. The first one being a 0.75% of December, 2025. Uh, that one was struck at, uh, $398 in micro strategy terms. Um, that was a $650 million deal. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, um, you know, when, so when he did that and announced that he was going to use the proceeds to buy Bitcoin, that's when the stock goes crazy, right? Yeah. And so at one point, you know, his stock got up to something like thirteen hundred or something, right? So at that point, uh, he he taps the convert market again uh, for big size, and this was this was actually a brilliant issuance because he issued now a zero coupon uh, bond due December of twenty. I think it was 2027, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this time, uh, the strike price is 1430, 1432 uh, on MicroStrategy stock, right? And this time, uh, that the size of that issue was uh, 1.05 billion. So between the two converts, 
he issued 1.7 billion of converts. And I was arguing that, you know, if you, if you think of, again, going back to the real option framework, he's now layered these, these two short put positions, right, into the capital structure. And I get, you know, I guess if you really want to be technical about it, technically, he, the company, is long the puts, the investor is short the puts. But I argue in a subsequent thread that, you know, really, um, the, the company's incentives are basically the same as the, as the uh, investor's incentives because, let's face it, management cares, management owns stock. Management is incentivized like a stockholder. Man- management is incentivized to maximize the value of the call option that represents stock. And typically, management um, really doesn't really doesn't care about creditors so much, right? And also, uh, true to form here, and I've seen this over and over again throughout my career, is that you know um, CEOs are eternally ebullient animals. They believe that their stocks can only go up, and so <clears throat> they issue these convertibles, and already fully count the fully converted shares and their and their shares outstanding as if the converts are already converted Mm -hmm. well wait a second because if the convertible bond doesn't get converted into equity it is debt it is debt that needs to be satisfied at maturity so that was the point of my thread and and so uh, and so the, the other point of my thread was that he's He's using his existing balance sheet cash plus the cash raised by 1.7 billion in convertible issuance, exchanging the cash, which is a zero vol asset, for a hundred plus vol asset that is Bitcoin, yeah. right? And furthermore, furthermore, um, kind of putting himself in this rhetorical trap where he said that, like, pretty much any free cash flow going forward is going to be used to acquire more Bitcoin, right? So, yeah, I mean, it is truly uh, a remarkable uh, thing. And, and so, but if that weren't enough, right, a couple months later, <laughs> a couple wait, months later, more. as we know, wait, there's more. He issues a $500 million senior secured note, this time due in 2028. But the difference this time is that he, he, this one has a cash coupon paying six and one eighth percent. Okay, um, so so he obviously has exhausted his convertible uh, his his convertible um, issuance capability. Yeah. So now he primed the converts by issuing something that's structurally senior and and um, just you know and also. It's structurally senior in that this convert is issued out of an opto, um, and it's also, you know, technically senior just by because that this is this is secured by his his main business. So the, I, I said in this subsequent thread that I wrote, you know, um, that you know this is now he's now materially. Uh, elevated the risk of what I call perception to reality risk, where, you know, the six and one eighth percent coupon eats up about 55% of his existing cash flow. Uh, furthermore, and I have to admit, I have not dug into the, the bond indenture, but any senior secured piece of paper, even in today's market, has got to have uh, covenants basic you know interest uh coverage and leverage covenants yeah so so you know the a a lot of the pushback that i got on my thread is that well you're just spreading you know fud that you know this guy's got diamond hands he's got 72 hater yeah he's a 70 he's got 72 percent voting control he'll never be a forced seller but again i remind people i go look the debt maturities don't matter if there's an event of default, just like in my El Paso trade, right? That I see, yeah. right? So in an event of default, if there ever were one, right? All these maturities uh, collapse to zero, right? So it's a it's a very interesting situation because now it's a, he's it's got- a cash flow issue basically, right? 
potentially but but there's there there's also this perception to reality issue right so the there in in 2008 um the perfect example of the perception to reality issue is what happened to banks right even healthy banks were running out of liquidity because you had a, a global run on the banking system mm -hmm. right um this is not a bank obviously but i posit that you know Right, right now he's still in the money on all his Bitcoin purchases right, with Bitcoin at 32, 33,000, what have you. But what if Bitcoin were to go down to mid to low 20s, uh, below his basis, right? Then you kind of got to wonder if you're one of his corporate customers, okay, am I going to renew that contract? Is this the right, you know, provider that I want to stay with? I mean, you know, does he have the eye on the, his eye on the ball? Um, so I wonder about that because, and, and it's, it's really interesting because his capital strategy, I built, I built a little spreadsheet today to kind of look at this a little bit further. Um, it's remarkable where his stock is trading. I have to say truly, truly remarkable because he's got the, he's trading at a five, his market cap is about five and a half billion. He's got 2.2 billion of debt on top of that. Right. And I think he's got about 83 million of cash. Uh, and then his Bitcoin holdings currently are worth about 3.4 billion. So if you wanna look at what his total enterprise value is, if you were to treat his Bitcoin holdings as just cash yeah. with no, no you know, illiquidity discount, well then you know, his, his net debt that means his net debt position is negative 1.3, right? Because his Bitcoin position of 3.4 exceeds his debt by, uh, of 2.2, right? Yeah. But that's bullshit. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is, this is like a hundred ball asset that can literally, as we've just found out, like in the space of like, you know, two months is cratered 50% because of a couple of errant tweets by Elon Musk. Yeah. So, so what if you had a situation where some random FUD, whether it's from Elon Musk or China cracking down, or sends this thing down more? Um, or, and what if he had to actually liquidate? So what discount do you want to put on that treasury asset that is not cash, right? So... So, you know, if you put a 20% discount on it, then his total enterprise value is 4.8 billion, which trades uh, at essentially 52 times EBITDA. <laughs> yeah. um, if, if you have a real cratering of Bitcoin uh, where it goes to, you know, say, you know, eleven or twelve thousand. That's that's the point at which the wipeout of value of his Bitcoin holdings exceeds the total amount of debt issuance. Uh, I calculate that to be around like eleven thousand five hundred. You got a real problem, yeah. right? Then you got a real, real problem because it's not clear to me at that point that his existing um, business. Uh, would survive that. Um, and I would even argue that just like right now, um, it, it boggles my mind that the, his, his, his business is trading at the valuation that it's trading concerning where it was before all any of the Bitcoin transactions. Yeah, and do, it's all um, like he's cleverer by half, right? Because he's currently winning on all this, right? The stock's at still at 600 from like 100 or something. Um, so right is, is well i mean i think is he, oh yeah yeah so, as so, like the, a fox so the equity the, the equity market um it, it, well either he's really really smart or the equity market is really really stupid or it's maybe some combination of the two right yeah. <laughs> but um yeah and you have tesla you yeah have i mean I, I hundreds times ebitda right so it's like yeah it, I agree with what you're saying, but it's also a piece of like, well, just yeah, as you're saying, the greater fool and someone wants to buy it. Speaking of which, who's buying that? Who bought those convertibles? Hedge funds, institutions? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that so the con the convertible market. Um, uh, I have to imagine just like the, you know, I think his senior secured uh, debt issue was many times oversubscribed at six and one eight. And, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, so he's got like infinite debt capacity. Well, but, you know, that, also, that's, that's also kind of bullshit because having been in this market, right, when you have a hot capital market, it's not uncommon for people to fluff their new issue demand by like five to 10x. Yeah. just to get like good good allocation to flip right so it's not his real demand for a senior secure note is not 5x the 500 million that's bullshit that's just not right and then um, how, does it, how does the zero percent convertible work they're basically just giving him money it's like it's just i'm giving you money for well, this i mean yeah so so like they're, they're basically it's i i can't remember what um premium it's sold at but you know presumably the people that are buying it are are either outright convertible funds that have to own uh they're, they're kind of like index equity index funds right but they have they have to own you know um a piece of the convertible or you have arbs that deem it to be cheap law but see here's the thing about in, in, in convert arb right the notion of implied ball is only as good as what your underlying credit assumption is, right? In options arbitrage, you never have to worry about a bond floor or a credit rating. An option is an option. Your, what your implied ball that you're buying at is 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 a hard number. But in a convert, underlying. that's right. But in a convert, right? You could be buying something that you that seems really really cheap. And I, trust me, I, I've made this mistake where you think that the underlying credit is like a 650 over credit and based on 650 over you're buying a 29 implied when actuals are trading at 55 let's say right mm -hmm. well a lot of times the reason why you're able to buy that cheap ball is because the credit really isn't 650 it's really like a 900 over credit or a thousand over credit and you're actually paying fair to to premium to what real ball should be worth. Yeah, that's a you pet, see what I mean. So, pet theory of mine that, that options are never cheap or expensive. They're exactly what the market is right. They're exactly what the market is pricing. That well, risk. It, it, it's just that it's just that the con, the convertible security is a much more complex security because there's so many different moving pieces. And now in MicroStrategy, you add the hundred ball Bitcoin into the equation, and it, yeah, it just gets geometric, right? It's like, how do you model that? Yeah, exactly. I love it. So, so you, yeah, so it'll it'll be it'll be really really interesting to see what happens. I I, I don't know uh, what happens, but you know, I think I think the point of my threads wasn't necessarily to predict this will happen and this will you know. Look, he's got he's got uh, a fair amount of time on his hands. Uh, what he has no control over is is uh, what Bitcoin price does uh, before maturity. Um, but I think that you know he's 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 kind of painted himself into unnecessarily into a rhetorical corner, right? By saying that he's going to use pretty much all cash flow to buy additional Bitcoin, yeah. because. You know, one thing that he could do that would be just heroic right now is that I believe his busted convert. So like one of his converts, his, his stock price is trading at 560. And so the first convert that was struck around 398 is still about 40% in the money, right? Uh, but the other convert that he issued, the billion dollar convert that struck at 1400, that's deeply busted. It's trading at like, you know, um, you know, it's uh, forty percent of the of the strike price, right? Yeah. And mind you, mind you, you know, when Bitcoin was at sixty three thousand, MicroStrategy stock never got past nine hundred again. So, so that that one uh, is a very very busted piece of paper, and I'm not as um, up on the current pricing but a friend of mine told me that those bonds are trading probably in the sev low 70s right now 
So, you know, one thing that he could do that he won't do is that, you know, he, he, he filed for a billion dollar shelf, right. To potentially tap his equity. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I were him and yeah. my stock is trading at this ridiculous valuation, I'd be tapping that shelf and buying back those bonds at 70 cents on the dollar because it's free money. Yeah. But if I'm Michael Saylor, no, you're diamond. I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to buy, I'm going to tap that shelf maybe and just buy more Bitcoin and leave myself no room to maneuver if Bitcoin ever to, were to ever go down. <laughs> I mean, at least that's what he says he's going to do. I have no idea. Well, maybe that's always in the back. So he can always, play that right if bitcoin keeps going down and that billion dollar convert keeps going down or 30 cents he can tap the shelf and but that's not going to be there forever the shelf either right yeah let's move on another thing if you want to talk briefly about what you're doing at smart re you're an advisor on their board or whatnot Oh yeah, so yeah, this is a a, a pretty interesting, it's t totally different from anything I've ever done. Um, uh, I'm a board advisor uh, to this company called Smarter, um, Smart uh, Smart Real Estate, uh, and what he's doing is he's tokenizing the residential real estate market. And what's what's you know the what's really interesting about this business model is that you have a cohort of aging baby boomers that are typically asset rich and cash poor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about how, you know, post financial crisis, or maybe we didn't talk about it, but post financial crisis given Dodd Frank and, you know, just banks reticence to, uh, to lend, especially to do things like cash out refis and reverse mortgages. A lot of, baby boomers can't really tap this massive source of equity uh, that is um, that is a big chunk of their net worth. Um, and um, at the same time, you've got uh, millennials that are, that are um, less rich than the boomers as a cohort, but want access to a, a long-term uh, inflation protected asset class that is U.S. residential real estate market. And what Smarter's business plan is doing is it's basically bridging that gap, right? It's allowing people to sell a fraction of their home equity without incurring any debt. That, that equity gets basically tokenized down to dollar increments and uh, people can buy. So it's a, $1 it's a timely business. Yeah, yeah. So in theory, I could buy... I could buy like fifty dollars worth of your home. That's right. Yeah. There in LA. Yeah. It's pretty. It's a very, very interesting business model. So, so that you, yeah. It's like you, I could purchase an individual home, like that I'd pick out on a map, or it's by zip code or something. Um, yeah. So he. So he's. Uh, he. He's. He's got. Um, he's already got eight thousand homes. Uh, through his platform, uh, and he's primarily 75% uh, Northern California and 20, excuse me, 25% Southern California. So he's looking to expand, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting. Something, something different than, uh, than what I've been doing, but it, it, it does, it's, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a crypto hater as much as I am a crypto skeptic in that I've I've really thought long and hard about, you know, for instance, the first dot com wave where you had all this uh, initial value accrual to these layer one companies, you know, the global crossings, the level threes of the world, et cetera, and all these you know B two B companies that were touting you know network effects, et cetera, and at the end of the day, the guys that were left standing were the companies that really made use of uh, the reach of the internet and their ability to garner cash flow, actual cash flows, right? Um, so if you look at what's happening during the current crypto craze, right, you've got all this money being aggregated in the tokens themselves. And the tokens themselves are really, you, you, there's no 
intrinsic cash flow generation capability. Even in some of the DeFi tokens, um, these ecosystems are built upon a a sort of payment in kind characteristic where you're dependent on the flourishing of the ecosystem, but the cash flows aren't coming in from without, right? Yeah. So, so a company like Smarter is interesting to me because it is making use of blockchain technology, but to disrupt an existing vertical that happens to be a very, very huge vertical. That has cash flow. So that's right. Huge cash flow and huge, I mean, it's just a massive market. So that's, that's why I took this assignment on. It's something that uh, is very, very interesting to me. And I, and I, I'm, I'm kind of leery that it, when all is said and done, the, the final crucibles of value are going to be in the tokens versus companies that can actually um, garner cash flows. Right. What's well, crazy, right? In one breath, yeah. we're uh, saying sailors crazy and in the next uh, investing in a tokenized thing. But that's America, right? That's that's yeah, but, but but it's to, but it's totally different, right? Because yeah, like yeah. one is one is levering up to buy a token, and you know this other situation is you're tokenizing a real asset, yeah, yeah, and making money on on the on the trading of of that asset. I will say it's like the prop firms in Chicago got together and were like, "Hey, let's create these token. It's just poker chips. Like they're sitting around the poker table of like." Let's use matches now. Let's use marbles now. Let's use, right, just to see who's the better trader and they all trade back and forth. So before we go, typically we ask uh, some favorites, but we talked a bit offline and you're a grade one, level five, triple A fanboy for Star Wars. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. <laughs> so we're going to... Uh, we're gonna switch my background first. There you go. Get over here in the Millennium Falcon. All right, all right. <laughs> and then instead of our normal favorites questions, we're gonna stick all Star Wars and dig a little deeper. So if you're ready, your favorite. <laughs> I'm ready. Favorite original movie. Oh, episode four. Okay, New Hope, all day? Yep. Not yep. Empire, I mean, I'm, I'm a little, you know, I like Empire, but it's it's New Hope that uh, that always uh, I I always wind up rewatching because I'll tell you what it's that initial initial uh, Star Destroyer scene that uh, just blew my mind when I was like six years old. So, yeah. um, <laughs> favorite prequel movies, if you have one, Revenge of the Sith. Revenge of the Sith, love it. Easily, um, easily. Favorite of yeah. the recent series. Which I'll include oh. Solo and uh, Rogue One in there. Okay, all right. Thank you for including Rogue One. That would have to be it. Um, I, I, how they tie right into the Star Destroyer scene you mentioned is awesome. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not a fan of the latest uh, three sequels at all. Well, I, yeah, <laughs> they're just retelling it with slightly different, right? It's like, come up with something new. It was just a rehash. Oh, th this is a, a, we could go deep on this one. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll do another podcast. Just a uh, favorite animated series? Star Wars, we're talking, right? Yep. Um, I would have to say the Clone Wars. Um, yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Dave Filoni fanboy and he's a, uh, he, see, he actually is a fanboy. Yeah. Like Kevin Feige is a fanboy for Marvel. And we need a fanboy running that franchise. Yeah, which they could have done, right? Any of those concepts that he had in Clone Wars would have been great for the, I mean, that's what saved the prequels kind of, of him coming in and, and polishing that up. Uh, that's right. Favorite non-canon book. Have you gone into any like Thrawn trilogy stuff like that? You know, it's been it's been actually a very very long time since I've actually read a Star Wars book, but I I I do, I do love those uh, those uh, original Timothy Zahn Heir to the Empire yeah uh, series. But you know, I I mean the Star Wars expanded universe is just so huge I can't even keep up with it. Yeah, um, I used to have yeah bookshelves here. I, oh, I'm in the Millennium Falcon, but when I was like yes. I probably read a hundred of them. I mean, it, it got out of control. Um, you might be a bigger fanboy than me. 
<laughs> um, bad guy or girl? Oh, Boba Fett. Okay. Right. Oh, for sure. Because because I got I saved up all those proof of purchase action, uh, those proof of purchase Kenner things when I was a kid. Yeah. And I remember getting that Boba Fett action figure before Empire Strikes Back came out. And I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. I don't know who he is, but I like him. <laughs> <laughs> you you saw in my uh in our investors guide to the uh, Star Wars fans guide to the investing, I think I equate them to Microsoft. Like looked cool back in the day, now kind of looks like a guy in a gray sweatsuit. <laughs> And his death, I don't quite agree. He could have had a more uh, pronounced death. No, but I think the expanded universe says he survived the Starlight. Exactly. Well, and we just saw him, right? We just saw him in... Uh, That's right. World. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, favorite good guy or girl? Oh, Han Solo. You're sitting in his seat. I'm sitting in his seat. Ne never tell me the odds. I like that. <laughs> I kind of live, I live by that motto. Right. Um, <laughs> although he strikes me as like a short gamma guy, right? <laughs> yeah yeah i would say that <laughs> for sure um and then favorite creature or alien Ooh, uh creature or alien that's a tough one because uh i love all the aliens i i, I collect a lot of stuff i have all the 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 can the bus of the creatures from the cantina um yeah Wow. Did, did you get that? Uh, my son got for Christmas the Cantina special Lego set. Do you see I don't that? have that. I have a couple of big Lego sets. Um, well, that's a tough one because I, I like, I, I like a, a lot of different creatures. Maybe. Um, huh. I'll tell you mine is Salacious Crumb. The, oh, uh, I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, Return of the Jedi was my least favorite of the, of the original. Mainly because they got too cute with some of these little. The Ewoks, yeah. yeah, no, I, I I like some of the the darker uh, things. You know, I like I like the Rancor though. I mean, you know, he was yeah. he was pretty cool. <laughs> thanks so much, Michael. This was fun. All right, thanks, Jeff. The derivative is brought to you by CME Group. CME Group is the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures and options, visit cmegroup.com listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCMAlt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at RCMAlt.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.